to irrigate out of a reservoir. We'll get into that in a minute. This is our reservoir. We pour water in from the irrigation district and it's gonna come, if you, if you sneak through here, you can see, comes out these white pipes over here. The far right pipe will be from the irrigation district and the middle one will come from our, our well, if we ever well wanted water. to pull well water up, which we prefer not to because that messes with our nitrogen balance. Um, so the general process would be, we put water into this, clean water. We use a little bit of pond dye just to keep the algae down. Um, and then we'll, there's a deep straw in here. This is our main pump. So this pump sucks, it's got a 16 foot deep straw. Oh wow. And there's a inlet underneath the water, probably about eight feet, eight feet down in the water right now. The reason our reservoir is so full, even though it's this time of year, is we're actually using it to recharge our groundwater for our well right now. Okay. So we can take at the end of the year, if our irrigation district water isn't all used up, I can put it into the ground and then we get something like 60 to 40% of it back through our groundwater. It's called a GSA. It's a groundwater resources something. We can look up what that so is. So it's a good exactly. thing for you to use less so then you can put it back in your well. Yes, but m mostly it's when there's going to be, they've just redone the water here. Okay. So during droughts, they're going to be metering people's pumps now. We've actually lost the Frank Kern Canal down south um, near Bakersfield. has actually lost like eight feet of elevation. Oh, wow. Over the past 30 years. Um, and it's still sinking at something like one to two inches a year. And that's simply from groundwater depletion and then the soil just sinks down. So overuse so, of the water, pulling too much water out. Yeah, all over the valley we've pulled way too much water out over and over. So what they're doing now is they're metering wells and then they have these uh, you know, groundwater strategic resource area, GSA. Um, and then they'll use those to monitor how much groundwater you have per acreage. And you can get more basically by being a good citizen and refilling. So okay. if there's a year where there's extra water, your district may have free water available for you to for you to bank. It's called water banking. It's water banking. Yeah. And so what you do is you say, give me this water for free. I'll pay the surcharge to deliver it. And then I'll put that in the ground. And when the drought comes, I can pull 40% of that back out or 60% of that back out. And that's dependent on GSA that you're in. Okay. So part of the, this is a dual purpose pond. It's our, it's our uh, reservoir so that we can keep a constant stream of water coming in without losing any head pressure but it's also a uh, recharge basin. And what's the volume? How much, what's the size roughly? Uh, that's a good question. So it's 200 feet on each side. Um, and I would say we could probably store maybe an acre foot and a quarter in here, maybe a oh, little bit less a good than amount. that. So a, fair, a fairly large amount, but you know, not enough for a whole season by a long okay. shot. So you probably use what, two, two, the, this amount times two for one season? Yeah, we're probably using uh, on a hot summer, we'll use north of two and a half acre feet. Okay. Um, but on a on a normal year, maybe two point two is probably a good guess. And do you inject uh, the nutrients? Do you fertigate? Like what, what's that yeah, process? Yeah. So the water will come in here, comes out of this straw. We've recently actually, because we're obsessed with redundancy, because who knows what will go wrong all the time. It's <laughs> farming. This is a brand new pump, and we we put this in as a backup. But as we put it in, we realized we had 50 feet of head pressure or 50 PSI of head pressure coming from the irrigation district. The irrigation district runs through a property underneath and goes out the other side. You can, if you zoom up there, you, you'll be able to see a little uh, pipe going into the ground. Oh, I see it. You see it by the canal. That's uh -huh. the irrigation water that goes underground, comes up, we have a meter, and then that comes back down and it empties into this pond. Over here. Well, we, we added this big yellow pipe here as an extension to get that water directly into our irrigation system. So we're actually using the, the head pressure from the irrigation system uh -huh. to, to give us an additional 50 PSI to start with. So when okay. we run this centrifugal pump, we're saving a ton of power right now. So we currently just installed a controller that will pause our entire irrigation going out, put some back pressure on this, back flush all the algae back into the pond and then restart the irrigation all without us putting our hands on it so at all. So that happen all wow. by itself. So then it comes through here. Um, you'll see all these little connections in here. 
And this guy is going to be coming in. Let's see, where's he going in? This guy goes into the actual right before the filters. This is plus boric acid. Um, where's this copper? Sorry, this is copper sulfate. That's plus boric acid. But the copper sulfate goes in and it basically acts as an algicide that kills off the algae so it doesn't grow in our filters. Okay. So that injects right before the filter and then it, it ideally eats itself up on this stuff and then we'll go through the line. So we have our A tank, we have our B tank, and we have our uh, acid tank. And I'll show you those in a minute. But those are all injecting proportional to the amount of gallons going through the line. Okay. So for every 1,000 gallons going through the line, we specify, I want this much of this, I want this much of that, and I want this much of this. The acid is actually controlled by a pH machine. Um, and because you want to control, just like when you're growing, I'm sure when you're growing dragon fruit, you want a certain pH range for the water and the soil. Coming yes. In. We want a specific pH. Uh, I think it's like 5.3. It should be listed up here. So it's more acidic. 6.1, Yeah, so we're keeping the water at 6.1, um, and that's a self-feedback. So just so, slightly acidic, not bad. Yeah, so that's actually reading the water coming in and then resetting it over and over all the time as long as there's water. So then we come through here, we inject. Right after our injection, we have a static mixer. Um, that acts just like you would have a static mixer for grout or glue or whatever. Okay. Um, and it goes through there. This isn't a secondary filter. This thing we can take out and clean, as opposed to these you have to back flush and then refill the sand and all that. This one you can just pop it out and clean it by hand. This is our sort of last line of defense against any critters that are gonna block up. So this is your the, uh, final final clean. Yep, this is your last chance. And then the risers themselves have little filters on the hoses, Okay. but those were getting so plugged up we had to take them off. So right now this is our last line of defense. And when there's really heavy algae growth in the summer, like during an algae bloom or something, We'll be cleaning this guy out three three times a day sometimes. Daily. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. Yeah. Three times a day? Wow. But that's, I mean, that's only if we're having a real big problem. Normally, it would be like once or twice a week. Okay. We'll keep us going. Uh, but but if, the, if the pond is full of algae, then the sand filters get full of algae, then this gets full of algae, and it just goes down the line, and then the lines get algae, and it'll actually grow inside the lines and get worse. And, it can become a nightmare. A so nightmare. Okay. between the copper and the phosphoric acid, we're really trying to keep the pH in a place where we can't grow any algae in here. And that 6.1 or whatever is the, is, is the magic number. That's our that's our number. And that'll change during different times of the year slightly, but that's okay. all. So it's going to change during August if it's hotter. Yeah. Okay. We when it's when it's hot outside, we use this machine to inject calcium and potassium. Oh, what do you how do, what's calcium and potassium do? Um, calcium is for rind. Okay, so um, a thicker it's another, rind, right? It crossover with dragon fruit as well, actually. Um, you'll have thicker, thicker, more robust rinds that won't rot as easily okay. with more calcium. Um, and then potassium, I don't know what potassium does. There, there, there's always something. Um, these guys are actually really hungry for calcium and potassium. It's one of the things we were hoping for from our experiment with coconut cork because it's really high in potassium, but uh, it, it didn't it work didn't out. It didn't work out. It's a, the problem with the coconut core that we ran into was it was just, it's a very sensitive tree. It's very sensitive to temperature. It's very sensitive to wetness. And the coconut core wasn't getting it wet enough um, or dry enough. It was kind of staying in between where we wanted to be as so far the as the, the wetness happening. of the root zone. And so we never really got the growth we were hoping for there. Um, but anyways, so this is our mixing tank. So we mix, throughout the year, we have different mixes of fer fertilizer that we want to be, um, big. yeah. There'll be some agitators inside there. Um, we have different, I think we have, so we have phase one, which is no fertilizer. We have phase two, which is high nitrogen, but then phase two is broken up into 2.1 and 2.2. We have phase three, 3.2, phase 4.1 and 4.2. So you fertilize so often. <laughs> there's seven phases of different levels of fertilization. Damn. Um, and, you know, we'll start with the high nitrogen mix for bud differentiation and to get enough nitrogen stored in the tree but if you put nitrogen in late season, the, the tree realizes, hey, I'm getting nitrogen. That means I'm healthy. I'm going to stay alive. 
So the tree will want to go vegetative instead of fruit growth. Uh, okay. So not only does it get your tree to have a bunch of suckers coming out when you don't want the suckers, it also keeps your fruit green. Because if you think about the tree as a unit that's trying to prop it, perpetuate its genes through a long period of time, it'll see that it's going to be healthy for a long time, and it'll it'll basically say what the equivalent human interaction would be of I there will be time to procreate later right now I should focus on personal growth right okay. um, and so the tree goes into that mode and then you're suddenly you're not growing your good beautiful sweet fruits with the robust rind that looks beautiful and tastes beautiful you're getting these green little rock hard guys that they say if the seeds this year don't make it that's okay we'll be here next year that's what the tree and that's all because high of too much nitrogen is. yep okay now if you put that nitrogen on and the tree's flushed full of nitrogen and happy during bud differentiation, it'll take that nitrogen and say, we have enough stock here to put out a good seed year. So as long as it's keeping that nitrogen coming in when the thing starts, you'll actually get bigger fruit in the beginning. So you want nitrogen in while there's fruit on the tree and before there's fruit on the tree, but when the fruit gets to a certain point, you need to stop. Okay. And what do you switch to, potassium? Well, you're always putting potassium in. Okay. And so we have, uh, I won't, yeah, we contract with a guy who helps us build like a custom mix for our fruit based on our soil and our water and all that stuff. So because we contract with him, I can't go over exactly what all we put in it. No secrets. But it's various, we, we're, we're always putting in various levels of NPK and then micronutrients. We've got copper, uh, boron, molybdenum. Um, Is the iron one? Uh, you want to, you want to, yes, we do use iron cause there's, there's one of our tanks you'll see has like a bunch of red stuff in the bottom of it. Um, and then calcium, uh, phosphorus. Well, that's the P in NPK, I guess. Um, and there's one more that I'm missing. It'll come to me or it won't. We'll have to decide on that later. <laughs> these are our proportional injectors. So that's all controlled through the computer. Okay. And these tell we tell these every time we set an irrigation up, I want you to do this amount, you know, this ratio of fertilizer to um So you're in other words, water. you're always injecting something when you're watering? Except for phase one. Okay. Which is uh from after harvest until we we start our fertilization program. Okay, so, so there is one, an off season yeah. of just pure water. Yeah, but we don't normally put a lot of water on during that season because that's the rainy season. Mm -hmm. And you don't really need to, these things don't drink a lot over the winter. So you actually want to dry them out as much as possible because when you dry them out, they get healthier roots. We're always trying to put just as much water on as the tree needs today, okay. no more. So we have sensors and we dig roots daily during the summer to see how deep is the water going, how wet is it at each level. Uh, ideally, we would like our root zone to be about this deep. We'd like eight to 10 inches in the top okay. for okay. all of our roots to be. And you want to keep that wet enough that it's drinking, but dry enough that you don't start to get root rot there because you can put too much water there and you'll get alternaria which is the rotting disease. Same thing that comes on the fruit when the fruit starts to rot on the outside. Uh, it's a type of mold, you can smell it. It's why we put the phosphoric acid in there. Okay. And so you want to use that season after the fruit comes off when you don't need the tree to be growing because it's too cold. You want to use that season to rebuild your roots and kind of like get your roots to sit out in the mat where they're supposed to be. So that when the time comes that you have to put a lot of water on, there's enough roots there to suck it all up. Okay. So we're trying to get those surface roots back, putting just enough water on so that the tree knows there's water available here without overdoing uh, and, and causing some sort of root rot. Last year we had some problems with root rot and we had to do like a six week intervention with phosphorus and all this different stuff. Really? And yeah. that was all caused by overwatering? Yeah, okay. just by keeping the root zone too wet. Um, and it's not, I mean, it's not overwatering like a waterlog mm -hmm. thing. It's just could be better. I mean, you're talking about optimizing the last 10% at okay. that point, you know?